All right, Mike. Well, we got some questions here. Okay. We got two of them. First question is, basically, when Mike covers the kingdom of God and or eschatology, can he touch on this idea of the earth, kingdoms, and even in Hebrews, where it says the heavens being shaking, how that connects to the casting out of demons as well, and ultimately the overthrow of Satan and other principalities, both at the cross and ultimately through the church in the last days? Yeah, it's sort of the wording of the question almost seems to answer the question. I mean, it, it the shaking of the foundations, shaking of the heavens, that kind of language um, is, of course, in the Old Testament, most closely associated with the day of the Lord. But it's also associated with the, again, consider the, the, the phrasing here with the coming of God okay, to earth, which in the Old Testament, you know, again, is mostly wrapped up in the day of the Lord. But if you think about the incarnation, the ministry of Jesus and all that sort of stuff, well, we do have God returning to earth in, in the person of Christ, even though it's not, you know, day of the Lord's setting. We don't have a final judgment, you know, of, of the nations, for instance. But, you know, we, we have both of those things going on with this language. And so when you get into the New Testament, you have the first, you know, coming, of course, God returns to earth in the form of Christ. And so you, you, you know, you have a theological or conceptual connection with that. And the whole thing about, it's very, in the, in the unseen realm, I discuss a, a bit about how the casting out of demons is, you know, sort of cast as the, uh, you know, sort of, sort of a stock element or part and parcel of the advance of the kingdom of God, the inauguration, the advance of the kingdom of God, because the earth has to be retaken, has to be taken back. And, you know, specifically, you know, when you, when you talk about taken back, it, it's not to exclude the need for Israelites to sort of come back into the fold because they it's their Messiah. They need to believe who this person is, that the Messiah is actually there. But it, it applies chiefly, again, to the nations that, that were disinherited at Babel. And so, you know, you've got this sense that, that the land that's not part of Canaan, you know, part of the promise, is under dominion of hostile powers of darkness. And so the, in the day of the Lord, that's going to be ultimately reversed. But now we have, again, the, the, the kickstarting of the kingdom of God. And again, the, the coming of God to earth is part of this, this, this language, you know, this, this motif uh, in the Old Testament. So you can see where, where sort of how both sides, the inauguration and the consummation of the kingdom, both sort of hook back into this shaking, you know, language that is, is for the most part associated with the day of the Lord, but not exclusively. You know, it is associated with, with judgment of evil. Uh, you have Psalm 18, for instance, God being roused to activity against evil. Again, you can, you can see that as part of the ministry of Christ, you know, judging, you know, sin, judging demons, you know, even something like the uh, the, the money changers and whatnot draws on some of this image. So I, I, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. It just happens in stages. But the language itself, you know, to sort of you know, shorten the answer, the language itself is connected with the day of the Lord and the taking back of the nations. And that obviously in the Gospels begins uh, at the first coming, you know, when, when Jesus is present. All right. Second question is a quick one on Psalm 82, 5. Is this God speaking about the divine council being fallen, walking about in darkness, causing havoc on the earth? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really dealt uh, with this. I mean, the language of Psalm 82, 5, let's just you know, read it. Again, this is ESV. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I, I tend to think that it's not referring to the gods, it's referring to their victims. And you say, well, what, what, what would that have to do with all the foundations of the earth being shaken and walking about in darkness? It, this language, again, is, is used of, you know, sort of this you know, cosmic upheaval, again, that's, that's solved, but well, it, it's actually both caused and solved in a judgment sense at the day of the Lord. Uh, in other words, you you know, at the day of the Lord, the final judgment, God comes back and there's, you know, lots of big upheaval and judgment and violence and all this kind of stuff. Again, it's portrayed in, in this manner. 
you know, the stars falling from heaven and the celestial objects going wacky and, and whatnot. So this whole idea of the foundations of the earth being shaken, that refers to things not being the way they should be. And sometimes it's used of God's activity when he's judging. Uh, and again, in an ultimate sense, the day of the Lord, because when God starts going to town on, on evil, uh, then there's lots and lots of upheaval. It, 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 it's a cosmic uh, event. But it, the language can also speak to things not being the way they should be outside of God's judgment. That, you know, God God made the world work in a certain way, and he wants things to work in a certain way. And when they don't, you have this language of the foundations of the earth being shaken, or again, you know, similar kind of language that what's happening here is contrary to God's will. It, it's chaos instead of order. And when you associate it with the nations, it, it naturally gets associated with other gods because they're the ones running the nations that were disinherited. And so all of this is viewed as contrary to what God wants. Now, again, that last thing I said brought the gods into the equation. I think, again, a, the most straightforward reading of this is that it refers to their victims. But since the victims are in chaos because of what the gods are doing, they are involved, but it's not like the gods are going, running around bumping into walls, you know, that sort of thing, that, that they have no understanding, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, having said that, again, you will, you know, encounter scholars on the other side, you know, that that basically this could either be a referent to the gods being judged, but then you actually get the judgment in, in verse 6. And so some people would say, well, it's kind of out of order to have the judgment happening before verse 6, because that's really when it's announced. But, you know, the, the rebuttal of that is, well, you know, God can still be judging them before the ultimate judgment, which is, you know, taking away their existence, that, that sort of thing. So scholars are actually, you know, divided on who exactly is referred to referred to here? And do we even need to pick? Is it the people of the nations, or is it the gods, or is it both? And to be honest, you know, I, I really haven't settled uh, on, on what I think here. Again, one seems to be a more transparent option than the other, but I think they're all, they're all sort of in the picture. I, I want to go back you know, to the, the first question, too, and, and just mention that, again, that this whole thing about the day of the Lord and the kingdom of God and whatnot, this language also is used in other passages. It's not just Psalm 82. For instance, if readers go to Isaiah 34, uh, verses 1 to 8, you get the same kind of language where, again, the gods are part of the picture. So I'll, let me just read that real quickly. Draw near, O nations. Okay, nation, speaking of the nations, again, who are under the, the dominion of other gods. Draw near, O nations, to hear, give attention, O peoples, let the earth hear, and all that fills it, the world, and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations, and furious against all their host. And host can have a double referent. Does it mean their armies, or does it mean the host, the divine beings running them? Okay, it could be either or both. He has devoted them to destruction. There's the Karem word that was used in the conquest accounts. Again, people who've read Unseen Realms should be real familiar with that. He has devoted them to destruction. He has given them over for slaughter. And again, doing that to the to the giant clans in particular in the conquest event, that prepared the land. It cleansed the land for occupation and ownership by Yahweh. And so you get the same, again, flavoring here. Their slain will be cast out. The stench of their corpses shall rise. So that suggests the host here you know, refers to human beings, the armies you know, of the nations. Okay, but just hold on one second. The mountains shall flow with their blood. Again, that's very human in orientation. Then we get to verse 4. All the host of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their host shall fall, as leaves fall from the vine and leaves falling from the fig tree. So again, you get this judgment on the heavenly host as well. And we know, again, from other passages, other discussions, that the heavenly host, again, and and divine beings, those were those were two things that since we're modern, we disconnect them. Well, the heavenly host, those, you know, we, we know we know about astronomy now, and we don't connect that to the spiritual world. Well, the ancient person did, and we've talked about that on the podcast a number of times. So that, you know, brings in the heavenly host language to this sort of judgment, earth being shaken, all that sort of stuff. If you go to Isaiah 24, uh, in verse 18, you get some pretty pronounced examples of this too. He who flees at the sound of the terror shall fall into the pit, 
and he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught in the snare, for the windows of heaven are open, the foundations of the earth tremble. The earth is utterly broken, the earth is split apart, the earth is violently shaken, it staggers like a drunken man, it sways like a hut, its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. On that day, and that's stock language for the day of the Lord, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on earth. So there you have both the human and the divine elements, again, so on and so forth. Again, the point being that it's not just Psalm 82. There's language like this connected to divine beings, the judgment of divine beings in conjunction with the day of the Lord. But it's also linked again to the general judgment of God, God coming, you know, being angry with sin and and trying to reclaim what is his and, you know, assert his authority. Well, Jesus certainly does that the first time around when the kingdom of God is inaugurated. So it would be natural. It'd be, it, would, it would not be unexpected to see this kind of language connected to the casting out of demons and whatnot uh, as part of that, that whole process and as part of the series of events.